Turn with me in your Bibles this morning to the book of Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. We are continuing in our September kind of fall kickoff series called Devoted. And uh, we're looking at the first picture of the very first church. And it's a a few verses. And every week we're just kind of immersing ourselves in the whole picture. And I just want to read it for you one more time. Starting in verse 42. It says this, they devoted themselves, this is the very first church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This right here is the word of the Lord. And this is, like I said, it's the very first picture of the first church. Before there was church buildings, before there was staging and lighting and pulpits at the front. Before there was any of this, this right here and what we just read is what the church did. Now, interestingly, out of this passage of Scripture, out of all the amazing things that, that Luke lists here, there's only one thing that was mentioned that, that was repeated. Did you see it? It's this, that they ate together. Quite literally, Nat, can you uh, hand me the, the bread? The, the, the phrasing here, oh boy, Oh, boy, okay. Wowza. Wowza. They, it says that they broke bread. In verse 42, it says they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. And then again, in verse 46, it says, In breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. This right here. (laughs) It's really hard. Okay, all right. (laughs) Thank you. You ever see those guys that rip phone books? Like those strong men? This is the Danny Gray version. This is my Samson moment right here. It says that they broke bread. The only thing that gets repeated in the first picture of the first church was that they broke bread bread with together. So yes, like why? Like what's the importance? Well, we we do have to understand what's happening here. You see, because in the first century, before the modern day printing press or the ability to bold or uh, italicize something, what you would have to do if you wanted to show something's just all out importance, the only way that you could really do that was by repeating it. And so actually all throughout the scriptures, we, we see this. We, we, we see this from Genesis through Revelation, the authors of the text. Remember a few weeks ago, I talked about like 40 different authors. Most of them have moments where they do exactly what just happened here. They want to stress something, so they repeat it. The only thing that gets repeated is the breaking of bread. Yes, they listened to sermons, but that didn't get repeated. Yes, they were generous with one another, but that didn't get repeated. Yes, even miracles were taking place in the early church, but that didn't get repeated. The only thing that gets repeated, the only thing in this text that is actually highlighted, bolded, it's like cap locks, right? It's drawing our attention is the fact that they ate together. So we do have to ask the question, why? Out of all the spiritual stuff in this passage, Why is breaking bread the only thing that gets repeated? And there is an answer to this. It's because the very first church understood exactly who they were. They they knew exactly who they were. They were first century Talmudims, right? They were Holy Spirit filled. That Talmudim is the Hebrew word for disciple, right? A, A disciple, just so you know, a Talmudim is Quite literally, it's a pupil, um, a a learner. The the best uh, understanding is this, that they were apprenticing a master. The first church understood that for them, their entire reason, why they were around, was to mimic their master, Jesus Christ. 
And so what they're doing is they're looking back on Jesus, which again, for them, was just days ago. And they're looking at Jesus and how he lived his life and what he did with his time, and they're trying to model him. And again, Luke stresses that the main way they were modeling Jesus was by eating and drinking together. Let me just show you this. Luke, who wrote Acts, also wrote the Gospel of Luke. It's a two-part series. And if all we had was the Gospel of Luke, uh, interestingly, did you know that there's actually over 50 references in Luke alone to Jesus and food? 50. I'm not going to read you all 50, but I do just want to give you like a small handful this morning, okay? Let's just look at this. Luke chapter 2. Jesus was born in a feeding trough, as if to say that he is food for the world. In chapter 5, he eats with tax collectors and sinners at Levi's party. In chapter 7, he's anointed during a meal at a Pharisee's home. In chapter 9, he feeds the 5,000. In chapter 10, he eats at the home of Mary and Martha. Chapter 11, he rebukes the Pharisees at a meal. Chapter 15, the story, the great parable of the prodigal son ends how? The feast, right? In chapter 19, Jesus invites himself over to dinner at Zacchaeus' house. Chapter 22, the last supper, or 24, right after resurrecting, one of the first things Jesus does is he goes and breaks bread with two men on the road to Emmaus. Then after that, he finds his disciples and he asks them, hey, do you guys have anything to eat? Apparently, Coming back from the dead makes you very hungry, right? Like New Testament scholar Robert Karras says this, in Luke's gospel, Jesus was either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. <laughs> Parkwood, I don't know about you, but I like this Jesus very much. <laughs> very much. So you need to see the picture now in Acts. The early church. The very first church is looking back on Jesus' life and they're trying to do everything that Jesus did. And the one thing that Luke stresses in Acts chapter 2 was that they were opening up their homes and they were breaking bread with one another. Now, interestingly, when you study this, not just Acts chapter 2, but when you look at the, the, the New Testament church, the first century church, there's actually three different ways that the uh, first uh, century church broke bread. There's three different ways that they actually leveraged breaking bread with one another in their, in their favor. And so this morning, what I want to do in our time together is I just want to show you the three ways that, that the New Testament church was breaking bread. You ready for this? Okay, here's the first one. If, if, if you're taking notes, write this down. They broke bread with one another. Now, this is the obvious one. This is Acts chapter 2, getting in their homes, breaking bread. Uh, I'm, but right here, what I'm talking about is Christians eating with other Christians. Right? That's what was happening a lot in the early church. And, and one of the reasons why is we have to understand is that the church, for a, a, a very long time in the beginning, they weren't meeting like we're meeting now. They, 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 they weren't meeting in in large rooms with a pastor that stood at the front and they kind of talk over the people and that kind of stuff. Like, I'm not saying this is wrong, but I'm saying this is definitely not how it was 2,000 years ago. What was actually happening at the beginning of the church was they were meeting in homes over meals. Now, there's a big reason for this. Christianity was illegal. And, and simply to have public worship and the public teaching of scriptures, it could get you beaten, imprisoned, if not murdered. So the church went underground. They were in homes, meeting over meals. Like, I need you to see this. The centerpiece of the church was not a pulpit. It was a table. And, and there are actually many examples of this in the scriptures. Other than Acts 2, I'll just give you another one. 1 Corinthians 11.33, Paul says this, to the first century church in Corinth. He says, so then, my brothers and sisters, when you gather to eat, you should all eat together. Now, I, I've heard some people actually go to this verse and it's like, oh, he's talking about church picnics. No, he's not. This is not talking about picnics. This is not talking about the odd potluck. He's actually talking about the Sunday gathering. You gotta understand the church 
uh, 2,000 years ago, they were meeting on Sunday evenings in homes, the centerpiece around a table, and he says, when you church gather to eat, make sure that you wait for everybody. Make sure everyone's there for that moment. The church was meeting together around tables, Christians with other Christians. You have to understand, Parkwood, to open up your home and to invite other Christians in, eat some food, and let God move in that place is actually to step into rhythm with how God created you. Like there is something, and and I know that this today doesn't seem like a deeply spiritual topic right now, because it's just like, what are are we eat meals? Yes, there is something so deeply spiritual about eating together. That's that's why it's highlighted. The one thing that's highlighted in Acts chapter 2 in that first picture of the church was this. They ate. And that's the first way. They ate with one another. Christians with other Christians opening up the doors of their home. But that was not the only way. The second way that they ate together was this. That they, they broke bread with outsiders. With outsiders, the, the, the early church in Acts, they didn't just view breaking bread as a thing to be done with other Christians, although that was core to how they functioned, but they were also to show hospitality, to open up their, the doors of their homes and cook meals and eat meals with those on the outside. I was um, at Devonshire Mall a while ago. I was in this store, and I forget what I was buying, and the lady, when I was making the purchase, she looked at me and she said, oh, are you an insider with us? To which I promptly said, I, no, I guess I'm an outsider, right? Like, but, but the reality is that that lingo, right, that language that this store was using is actually a reality that we all live in, right? There's, there's always people somehow on the inside, and then there's always those that are struggling to get in. Jesus, uh, what he does is he actually calls the church not just to eat together, but intentionally to find those on the outside and bring them in. I want to show you this. Uh, Luke 14, uh, 12 to 14. Here, here's what Jesus said. Then Jesus said to the host, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers, or your sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back so that you will be repaid. Now watch this. I love this. But when you give a banquet... He says, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Jesus says, eating together, breaking bread is not just supposed to be something that we do together. It's supposed to be something that we do intentionally to reach a broken world around us. In fact, I would argue that one of the greatest ways that Jesus and the early church advanced the gospel was by eating together. I think it was John Mark Comer who said that the kingdom of God advanced one meal at a time. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. And it's not just here in Luke. The the author of Hebrews, read this. I love this, this passage. Hebrews 13, 1 and 2. says, keep on loving one another as brothers and sisters. I love that. So he's saying like, Just keep on doing what you're doing. Love each other, eat together, rejoice together. And then he goes on. He says, do not forget to show hospitality. Now, hospitality here, you have to understand in the first century idea is only opening up your house and eating together. There's no other way of making sense of that other than that. So he says, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. (laughs) Isn't that awesome? I I love that the author of Hebrews says, hey, church, pay attention. Wake up. Listen up. It's great what you're doing. Continue doing it. Eat together. Rejoice together. But, but, he says, don't make the mistake of making it just about you. He says, open your mind, open your heart, open the doors of your home to the outsider, to the stranger, to the Hindu, the Buddhist, the Muslim, the atheist, the the, those in whom you don't exactly know where they're at. He says, open up the doors of your home to them, eat with them, for by doing so, some people have entertained angels. Oh, come on, how cool would that be? 
Like, I just pray one day I find out that, you know, some angel walked in my house. I, I don't know if we're going to find... My wife just raised her hand like she's the angel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just raised her She is an angel. Not the kind listed here, but she is an angel. <laughs> Rosaria Butter Butterfield, l listen to this. She says this, those who live out radically ordinary hospitality, I love that, radically ordinary hospitality, see their homes not as theirs at all, but as God's gift to use for the furtherance of his kingdom. They open doors. They seek out the underprivileged. They know, I love this, that the gospel comes with a house key. Now, this really is an area, um, and I've said this before, if you're anything like me, and by that, I mean you're white and you grew up in Canada, what we have to realize is that we have so much to learn in this area from other cultures around the world. Like, just think for a moment of the Spanish saying, mi casa es su casa, mi casa es su casa, mi casa es su casa. You know what I mean. My home is your home, right? Think about that. And then in comparison, think about the white Anglo saying, a man's home is his castle, right? Just one of those is a little bit more Jesus-y than the other. Can we just acknowledge that? Can we just for a moment just acknowledge that like, man, castles are designed to kill you. Like they have moats and drawbridges and archers and like, and this is our saying. A man's home is his castle. And this is how we have viewed our home. It's the place that we go to uh, to retreat from the rest of the world. The home is the place that, that uh, the world's just, it's, it's just crazy out there and we got to put up with a lot of stuff all day and we just can't wait till we get home where we can just kind of barricade ourselves away from all the hurts and the pains. But that is not the way of Jesus. That is not how Jesus intended for the church to operate. Like I said, literally one of the main ways that the kingdom of God came as a model through Jesus and then played out in real time through the early church was by eating meals, not just with one another, but with the outsider. The kingdom of God the, came. The lost were found one meal at a time. They broke bread with one another. They broke bread secondly with the outsider and then uh, the third way, and I'll close with this, and we're going to have a time of communion, is this. That they broke bread with God. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And he broke it. And he said, this, this is my body, which is broken for you. And then he calls the church. He says, do this in remembrance of me. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. Jesus calls the church deeper to actually eat of himself. We don't just break bread with one another. We don't just break bread with the outsiders, but maybe most importantly is that we actually keep centered to the church is that we're breaking bread with him our God, our Lord, our Savior. And listen, Parkwood, what we just believe here at this church is that what Jesus said, man, he means that, that communion, breaking bread with God, it's, it's a remembrance. It's a time for us, it's the chaos that is life. It's a time for us to come together to remember the cross. At the center of the first century church was a blood-splattered cross. You know, there actually was a point in history when the early church was trying to figure out what the symbol of our faith would be. Some wanted a rainbow, uh, some wanted a dove. You know, there, there was all these different images that were brought forth as a how can we actually symbolize the center of our faith and the thing that lasted was a cross. 
a tool used for executions. And the cross is a horrible object. I mean, it's a painful device that was designed to to murder somebody in the most gruesome, long way possible, and yet it became the center of our entire faith. Because what Jesus accomplished that day on the cross was no small thing. Jesus became the bread. In fact, in Jesus' life, he taught, I am the bread of life. And then in the Last Supper, he says, when you eat, it's my body that is broken. And I want you to remember that I, the bread of life, was broken for you. So he calls us to eat. He calls us to remember. He calls us to drink. But not without first laying out some guidelines. I want you to see this. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven 27 to 28. Paul says, So then, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Therefore, everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and they drink the cup. So here's unfortunately what's happened throughout church history. We've read that passage of scripture and we've said, okay, well, I can't come in an unworthy manner and man, I messed up something fierce last night. I can't take communion this morning. I can't break bread with God this morning. Brother, sister in the room, it is precisely because of the fact that you did sin last night that you need to break bread with God this morning. You sinning does not disqualify you from taking communion. Are we clear on this? Because sometimes we have this thought like, man, I did this, I did this, I did this. I'm unworthy. Hear me, you are unworthy. There's no part of this that that we come to the table because we're worthy. We come to the table because God invites us. This part right here where he says, uh, do not come in an unworthy manner is simply to say, don't treat this lightly. When we come to the cross, when we break bread with God, don't treat this flippantly. Don't don't treat this religiously. Don't don't come to the breaking of bread with God this morning like it's some holy snack time in church. That is not what this is. What this is, is an opportunity for us to throw ourselves on the grace and mercy of God, where he continues to give us what we don't deserve, where he continues to forgive us of our sins, where he continues to offer new life for us. Church, can can we stand on up all, all across this room? You should all have a packet like this. If you're at home right now watching online, uh, hopefully you've had a chance to go to your kitchen, grab some, some bread and some juice. We're gonna, we're gonna take communion in, in, in just a moment. We're not gonna take it right now, but what I wanna do before we take communion, the team is gonna lead us through part of this song. And, and in this moment, what I want us to do is I want us to center our minds and our thoughts and our hearts and our attention, everything that we have on the cross of Jesus Christ. If there are sins from last night, just bring them up before the Lord. Call out again for his mercy that will be available to everybody. But right now, let's not come in an unworthy manner. Let's not approach this fast and so we can move on, but no, rather we pause. We center our hearts and our minds because in just a moment from now, we're not gonna perform a religious practice. We are going to break bread with God. So let's center our hearts and our minds on him.